Well, good afternoon. Oh, wow. <laughs> this is loud. Um, I'm, can we put this a little bit lower so I feel a little bit more comfortable? <laughs> so I'm very excited to be here this afternoon um, with, with all of you. Um, I'm glad we, my wife and I, we moved back just about a year, a year and a half ago, back from the States and from Central America, from working there for now for over eight years. And now we're excited to join the family, the missionary family here in Europe. Amen? We're, we're all part of a family, you know. And the family, unfortunately, is kind of fortunately, but unfortunately is very small. So we get to know each other very fast, you know, everybody. Um, but um, just concerning myself, I'm actually, I'm back at, uh, I'm back at Bogenhofen. So 10 years later, I'm still at Bogenhofen, finishing my studies, <laughs> some studies at, uh, uh, in theology. Now, whether I will be a, pr- a pastor or not, that's still, still, uh, still not revealed yet. <laughs> At least not revealed, <laughs> you know. Um, but definitely, my major passion, my major burden, is to help advance the work in doing what I call business evangelism, uh, connecting ministry with business, so that people with any kind of talents, not just pastors, but any kind of talent, can work full time for God. Isn't that the coolest thing on the planet? When I realized this, it blew my mind. I'm like, whoa. So, so any job on this planet can actually be used to work for God. Not everybody needs to be pastor. When I was 18 and I got converted, I went to my church. <laughs> and I talked to the pastor and I said, hey, I want to work for God full time for the rest of my life. What can I do? What do you think he told me? Man, you got to become a pastor, okay? And, and now, now, being a pastor is a great thing, okay? Don't get me wrong. <laughs> many, some people, many, I don't know about many, but some people are called to be pastors, right? And they should be pastors, and that's great. But the worst thing is for somebody to become a pastor that is not called to be a pastor, right? And all of those people, us, ah, Maybe, I don't know if I should, where, where I'm in the picture, but we are called to use our talents, to use our skills, and here for ANOT, especially our health skills and so forth, to use to advance the work of God. Now, I didn't grow up with this idea, so this is why it was so amazing to me that we can actually use business. Business is to me like the vehicle, it's not any negative thing it's not a selfish thing or something like that but it's the vehicle that we use to to advance mission work right every health institution every hospital every university every school every project of some sort needs to have income if they're going to have people working there full time right so this is why it's the vehicle it's like the legs you know that make a person move so this is what we're going to be talking about, and especially um, the, the things that have ga- gone, I should, I, I, yeah, wrong, okay? Things that have, we've had challenges with in the past, and so we want to learn from the past to not make those same mistakes in the future. I've been doing now this mission work for about 10 years, and in this 10 years, I have a limited experience, but in this 10 years, um, I've gone through a number, I've, I've made a number of mistakes, unfortunately. Um, but at least the Lord opens my mind sometimes, you know, to help me not make those mistakes again, hopefully, hopefully. And, and so, and I want to share with you a little bit more about what those mistakes are, especially in concerning business, okay? The business part of ministry. This is something that most you know, often we don't talk about. This is actually, if anybody, who's been at ASI Germany last year? Okay, so some of you might recognize a few slides from this, um, but a lot of it is, yeah, is, is new and is specifically for this, for this convention. So um, 
Anyway, so let's get right into it. What are the top 10 mistakes? I put 10 mistakes. I don't know if they're the top ones. There's other mistakes probably out there that I don't know of. But what are the top 10 mistakes that we do typically in medical ministry, in the health work, in health evangelism, and so forth? And I'm focusing mostly on the institutional side of it. So let's go right into it. And uh, start with the first one. The first one, what is it? A lack of business sense or business focus. A lack of that happens very often. What happens is a, is a, is a typical idea. Is, uh, this happened to me when I was 18. And the Lord got me from, from doing my own things, you know, I wanted to be, actually, when I got converted, for me, it was clear I was going to be a missionary for the rest of my life. I didn't want to live a normal, boring life like everybody else, you know? I wanted to live something, you know, I wanted to live exci- something, something meaningful, something purposeful for God. And so I left, I left all of this, uh, the idea of making money, the idea of, of acquiring property or something, you know, like, this kind of an idea, I, all, I left that all behind and I thought that was all worldly, that was all selfish, and I need to get rid of that, and I need to become what? Poor, yeah, 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 yeah. And, we, and I glorified the idea of being poor. If I'm poor, then I'm more worthy, okay? Then I am, I, have you ever seen a rich missionary? No, right? No, it doesn't fit together. We think it doesn't fit together. And I believe that's a mistake. Now, we'll see where the, the balance comes. But the idea is that we think money or making money is something bad, okay? And I realize that that's not, that's not it's, like God, it's like the devil coming and he's like, no, no, running is bad, you know? Cut off your legs and, and crawl forward, okay? All right, right? But that's not how it is. But I, I realized this, and it really affected me. And, t- and unfortunately, it, it, I realized this much later in, in my missionary uh, adventure. When we first started the project, um, about tw- when I was 20 years old, 19, 20 years old, we, I went to Honduras. There's some people here from, that were in Honduras. And we, we were about to, you know, my friend had gotten a property donated and he called me. I was at Bogenhofen at that time. And he's like, Jesse, Jesse, I got this property donated. Let's start this project. Okay, we're going to start the mission school called the Central American Bible School. Right? I had gone to a mission school in Norway. And so we were trying to replicate that. And so I decided, I prayed and the Lord directed me to go to Honduras. So I went to Honduras and we were developing this project and, and I f- first, at first we thought, you know, yeah, faith means, means that you're not going to ask for any donations, right? You're not going to think about making money like doing business. Of course not. That's really worldly. That's for other people, you know. They can do that. They can give us the money, but, you know, we're not going to do that, right? And we're not going to ask for it either because that's also a lack of what? Faith. That's what I thought, yeah. And so we decided real faith means to kneel down and do what? Pray. Pray and God will provide. We will do God's work and He will provide. Amen? Well, in a way, that's true, right? Yeah, in a way, that is true. And, and this is the... To me, the, one of the coolest things ever. I mean, for me, it really strengthened my faith going through this period because the first, at least the first year of starting the ministry, we were, first we were just two guys, you know, and then we got five people and then seven, and suddenly we were 15 people. And the Lord somehow, miraculously, gave us at the end of the month exactly the amount of money that we needed to buy all of our food, okay? Not everything else, but all of our food, okay? 
And when we were two people, we had just a little bit. And when we were five people, we had just exactly the same amount more. And when we were 20 people, it was just exactly the same. I mean, like this, you know, I mean, proportionately. And it was very, very amazing because we were just, every month, you know, we were praying, Lord, you know, we need this food, you know. If we don't have this, I mean, all of our missionaries are going to go away, right? So, so, so the Lord really provided, I mean, and it was all with anonymous donations. We didn't even know where it came from. Just, it dropped in our bank account. <laughs> we just, you know, like a machine, you know. I mean, it was very, it was quite amazing. But that was just the first year. Uh, startups, God does some, some amazing things. But at the same time, we started to continue reading the Bible and also Spirit of Prophecy, and we started realizing that ideally, that it's okay for us to fundraise. Okay, I read these quotes, you know, of Sutherland fundraising from Madison, this and that, and I, and I started realizing, oh, oh, if he did it, and Ellen White was in favor of it, well, then maybe that's not a lack of faith, right? And so we started fundraising. We started getting into that. That was a little bit tough, in, especially in Switzerland, uh, that's where I'm from. That's, that's, that's not the culture in any case, right? So in America, it went a lot better, to say the least. So, so, but we got some faithful people in Switzerland too, praise the Lord. Anyway, so we started going into that. But then we continued reading, and, and then we started seeing, oh, the idea is for us to do what? Yeah, to be self-sustainable, right? Here. To be self-sustainable. And then we got into, we bought... We, bought, we started uh, a few businesses, some agricultural businesses and, and a few other things. And, um, and that really started helping us understand. And then later I found a quote, a very interesting quote. I don't know if you know about in the sanitarium work. When Ellen White talks about sanitariums, she says that our sanitariums should be so successful. Our sanitariums are our health centers, right? Should be so successful financially that they are able to generate the money to be able to fund the starting of a new sanitarium, of another sanitarium, to duplicate. I'm like, whoa, that's not just sustainability, right? No, that's profitability, right? That is profitability. So the Lord actually has designed us, wants us to be profitable in the way we do ministry. And so therefore, the work can move faster much, much faster, right, as, 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 um, as we move forward and we can start where there's one sanitarium, we can start two, and then two can start four, and four can start eight, right? So it moves exponentially. So, so this is what I realized, and at the peak of that, I read this quote, and this quote I want to share with you just to, like, undermine a little, I'm not undermine, but, like, put the foundation for this idea, Ellen White says in Review and Herald, the desire to accumulate wealth is an original affection of our nature implanted there by the devil himself. That's what I thought it said. I thought for sure somebody manipulated this quote. Okay. I mean, this is not possible that she's saying this, right? After years of me thinking, you know, being poor is great, you know. And, and, and I still think it is, okay? We're, we're poor, people are only poor in their minds, not, not, it has nothing to do with their pockets. But anyway, that's another thing. So, so I read this quote, and it shocked me, okay? It shocked me. And I read, but I, read the, I reread the quote, and I realized, and also the context, and I realized it makes an emphasis. It is the, the desire to accumulate wealth, okay, to, to, to get rich, is actually in our nature, put there by our Heavenly Father for one thing. What's the one thing? It is to advance the work of God. That is actually the noble ends that God has given us, right? 
These are noble ends means the noble objectives, right? It's not to make ourselves richer and try to build up our own kingdom and, and have fancy everything, right? Cars and houses and whatever. That's not the idea. The idea is to make money to be able to advance the work of God even more, even faster, right? And get off of this planet as quickly as we can with as many people as we can. That's the idea. So that's what it's actually for. So it, to me, it was really amazing. And when I studied into it a little bit more, into history, why, why do I have this idea that being poor is a good thing uh, and, and, and is honorable and so forth? And I realized, studying into history, that this is not, this is, this is it's much older, this idea is much older than what we are. Actually, it comes from, it's a heritage from the medieval time period the medieval time period and it was it was there where it with the in the catholic reign pretty much a reign right um they presented the idea that poverty is a is a good thing is a s- more spiritual things to be more humble humble means to be more 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 poor and and you could give all of your money to who? Yeah, to the church, right? And, and, you're, and they invented purgatory, right? Purgatory where you're burning, where your, your parents and grandparents are burning. And so if you give money, then they burn a year less, right? And so the, the poorest people would go there and give their last coins, you know, to help their grandparents not burn so long, right? And the other thing that they invented was, for instance, they took out the training and the knowledge of physiology. This is interesting for Enad, right? They took out the knowledge of physiology, and as soon as the people didn't understand physiology anymore, they needed to go to who to get cured? They had to go to the priest, and the priest would say, you know, pray five times Ave Maria, and pay me such and such, so much, and then you'll get healed. Your, stu- your stomach, you know, they didn't even necessarily know what was in here. You know, it was just something, right? And it was hurting, you know? And so this is how it was. And so they, they, they were actually able to make a lot of money off of a few things that they changed in their system. And then they made their priests and their monks make a vow. You remember the vow that Luther had? Yeah, it's a vow of poverty. Interesting, huh? So the highest spiritual leaders, they had a vow of poverty. They were considered the most spiritual, and so they had to be poor. That was the idea. And so they, with this idea, the, the Catholic Church has actually affected largely the economy of the world today. For instance, it was Luther when he when he first got out of it and started the Reformation, that eventually he came to the conclusion that not only were the, some of these doctrines wrong, but also the concept of money from the church. He said that, the, that money is a good thing. That money is a good thing. And being thinkers for yourselves and innovators and inventors and these kind of things, these are all good things. And so this, and, and there's books written on this, that you can see largely Protestant countries tend to be more prosperous. Yeah, tend to be richer countries. And largely Catholic countries, like Latin America, for instance, that is largely Catholic, it's all, it's, it is all a, a poor economy. It's very interesting, huh? Germany. United States, and so forth, right? A lot of the Scandinavian countries, and so forth. So this is very, it's a very interesting fact that I realize that it actually comes from there. In Spanish, in Spanish, you know, you didn't, they didn't go to the doctor to get cured. And, and they actually have a word for it. When they say, I'm going to go to the priest, what is the word that they use in Spanish? I, I don't know if anybody knows. Cura, that's right. I'm going to go to the cura. And that means the cure, the healer, right? And they actually mean the priest. 
Today, they don't even think of that. They just say cura, and they don't even realize that it actually means healer, right? But this is the tradition. This is where it comes from. So I realized that, and, and Luther realized this, and this is where the Protestant movement changed its paradigm into being much more self-thinking, self-motivated, creating their own businesses, creating their own, their own inventions and so forth, and not being controlled by, by the, the, the Catholic system. And they started reading all of the, the whole Old Testament where it says, if you do the right thing, then you will prosper. Then you will be blessed, right? We know the, the curses and the, and the blessings. Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26, right? These, this was the movement, right? Is to do the right thing and you will be blessed. And we have these examples. Even if we talk about Madison, some of you know about Madison. Madison was one of the first, it was actually the first institution that created the model, it was the blueprint on how that lay people were supposed to get involved doing self-sustainable evangelism, learning how to use their talents with their skills and use it for the advancement of God's kingdom. They had at Madison, very quickly, they had over 450 students and they were not allowed to pay tuition. Nobody. Tuition was free in a way. They were not allowed to pay tuition. None of them. But all of them had to start their own business. I didn't know this. You know, when, when people talk about Madison, they talk about the spiritual aspects. But they don't talk about the business side. Because, because of this idea that business is worldly. But it's not true. They invented... They had 50, imagine a college campus running with 50 businesses on campus simultaneously. Amazing, right? They had 27 of them were run by students, okay, by students. They invented businesses. I have pictures and uh, the White Estate, the archives, avenusarchives.org, they have all kinds of pictures of Madison, of their broom factory and their their printing press they had health food they invented most of the health food products like that are soy based they invented so that we drink soy milk or or soy coffee or soy uh soy meat soy whatever they inv they were the first ones to invent this in the states very interesting they had a large health food business they had farms they had factories, they had stores, they had restaurants, they had many, many things. And, and, um, but as a consequence of not doing, not accepting the business side in the evangelism part, we realize that, that uh, we think that we, and, and I've, I, I experienced this many times, okay, over the last 10 years talking to people, Nobody wants to start a for-profit company because for-profit sounds like yeah, you're, you're doing it primarily for money, right? Oh, that's bad, right? So we have to do a non-profit. Okay, it sounds much better. Oof, you know, my conscience feels much better doing a non-profit. So, so, so this is what happens, right? Uh, private ownership is also considered, you know, it's just selfish, right? Having large profit margins is really bad. You, they f you know, we tend to feel that we're ripping people off if we, if we uh, have, like if we, if we charge double the price than what it really cost us, we feel like, oh man, I just committed a sin, you know? And so, but if, if a sanitarium is supposed to start another sanitarium, well, they're supposed to have at least a good profit margin for it to actually work, right? Yeah. So, Making a business as really a success is problematic. You know, I'll tell a story right in a, in a, in a little bit about this. Stipends are better than salaries. It's more, it's better. It's everything is com common, commune, right? Our churches are, oh, this is another one. Our churches are too holy to be used for, for how did I say? Oh, for ministry. Okay, so it's only there for worship, not for ministry, right? And this is really, really common, okay? I, I, went, I was in Guatemala just a few months ago, two months ago, 
in Guatemala, in Central America, and I suggested to them, they were in a rich part of town, and, and I said, hey, why don't you do, why don't you do like a, like a daycare, or, or like for, kid, for small kids, for the rich people, you know, they, send their, they give their kids to you, and you train them like, like, uh, like for missionaries, you know, and, and, and then you give them back to them at the end of the day, right? And they deal with it, you know, I mean, you know, we can, but, and, and I suggested this, and they're like, yeah, but where would we do this? Where, I'm like, dude, you have a humongous church. You have like six rooms around the main building. You don't have to use the main building, you know, that maybe that's too holy, right? So let's use the, the rooms around it, and we can do daycare there. We can do, even you can do uh, music lessons there during the week. And people come, and you give them Christian material to play, you know, and, they, and, they, and, they, and so forth, right? And you have an influence on the community. You know what they said? Ah, uh, I don't think we can do that f- with our church, you know. We, it's, this is a, it's, a, it's a worship hall for God, you know. We can't use this during the week for profane things, you know. And I'm like, wow, wow. So, so our churches, and this is the amazing thing, that our churches, this is some, some businessman said this once, you know, our churches are the least efficient buildings on this planet, right? We have the huge building. Every businessman would say, this does not make sense, right? You don't open, you don't buy a store and then open it one day a week. <laughs> right? It doesn't make sense. Yeah, so, th- but this is what we do, right? And we are so comfortable with it because we've been doing it. Our parents have been doing it. Our grandparents, you know, so, so for us, it's just normal. It's like the church is closed all, all week. And then on Sabbath, we go there for three, week, for three, three hours and then we close it again, right? It's like, <laughs> great, we had, a, we had a great Sabbath. That was it. And so, actually, Mark Finley, I don't know if you know Mark Finley, but he's starting a new project based on this idea to make churches into centers of influence, to use the church building all week long to do services, actually to do health food stores. He, he wants to do a health food store here. He wants to do cooking classes down here. He wants to do all these different things, and medical stuff, physical therapy, and, and, and a physician, and so forth, different people, in the church building on the first floor, and then on the second floor, he has the, the sanctuary, I mean, the, where they actually, where they worship. And, and I think that is actually a better model, and I think it's a more of a model like in the early church. In the early church, they didn't have big sanctuaries, right? Actually, it's more of a Catholic model to have big sanctuaries and, and, and the building itself almost becomes holy, right? It's like a relic, you know? And you, you, think, you think stones become holy, right? It's like the building is... No, no, it's the presence of God. And they used to have church, all the early church, the apostles and so forth. Where did they have church? Yeah, in people's homes, or in their businesses, if they had, if they, if they had wealthier, wealthier, um, I was going to say wealthier Adventists. I mean, <laughs> wealthier Christians, right? Uh, during that time, that was the idea. It was so important, uh, this business aspect, and, and to Ellen White, it was also so important that she actually mentions this is uh, the central part of our education for all of our all of our Adventist kids. She says, all our denominational colleges and training schools should make provision to give their students the education essential for evangelists and for what? Christian businessmen. Wow. All of our colleges should train people how to do business. That would really change the way our church membership looks like, right? Yeah, it would really change. And this is this to me is the is the, the the analogy that really puts it into a nutshell. The body of Christ, the head of the head of the church, who is it? Is Christ, right? Yeah, the head of the church. The right arm of the church is what? Who? Yeah. Oh, it says it already. I, I gave it away. The left arm of the church. What is it? 
What do you think? Education, yeah, schools, okay? Church schools and, and even colleges and all this stuff, right? That's, that's the left arm. Ellen White says we should have a threefold ministry, a threefold ministry. We should have the right arm, the health work, the medical missionary work. We should have the educational work. And then we need to have the, the body. What's the body? The body needs to be connected with the right arm, right? What's the body? Is, is the gospel work, right? And now the big question. What's the legs? What's the thing that makes everything move? Makes everything run? Yeah, of course. It's business, right? It's sustainability. To me, this is very important. So this is the foundation for all of these other mistakes that we're, that we're now going to go through in a, in a little bit faster way, okay? This is, to me, is the foundation, is business, and a, a business focus while we do ministry. So we shouldn't forget ministry. That's also possible, okay? You can also get just in business and then forget about ministry. That's, we don't want to do that either. So let's go into into some of these typical mistakes that we do in our health work, okay? Next, pro the, the next, this is the problem. The next problem is to unfocus our ministry. Unfocus our ministry is to try to get, like in our lifestyle centers, to not have one focus. And, the, and this was brought to me when I, when I read this book. It's called Focus, right? Because the future of your company depends on it by Al Rice. Very interesting, he mentions, he mentions the, the importance of focusing our business for us to really be able to, to reach the customer or the person with our service or with our ministry, with our product, right? And, and, and this is a very good, I think it's a very good example for our, for our lifestyle centers that I've experienced often again, often uh, all over the place. So, Imagine, you have diabetes. You're 25 years with diabetes, okay? And you have pills and you're on, you're on, you know, you're on the whole system. Diabetes type 2, okay? And you're on the whole system and you don't know how to fix this problem. And you're searching online and you're trying to find a place that is going to solve your problem of diabetes. And you find online, you find two places you, s you call one, it says Lifestyle Center, you know, something, right? Lifestyle Center Sanitarium. And, they and, and we call, uh, the person calls with diabetes and says, hey, what do you guys cure? What do you guys heal over there? What do you do? What do we say? At all of our Lifestyle Centers, what do we do? We heal everything. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Why do we heal everything? Is that true? Well, in a sense, I mean, you know, we have the, the eight or the 12 or there's actually more than that laws of health, right? But we have these, the new start principles, the new start plus principle, and with that we can cure almost anything. Right? This is what we think. And, 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 it, and it's true in many cases, okay? Many different kinds of diseases if they have heart disease, we'll say, oh, this is the place for you to come, right? If you have cancer, where are you going to go? Oh, you got to come to us, right? And if you have high blood pressure, well, this is the place, right? This is how, this is how we do lifestyle centers. And, and in a way, that's true, but the person doesn't stop with this. It sounds good, okay? Sounds interesting. But then they call another place, and the, the place is called... Diabetes Institute. And he has, so, so what do you guys treat over there? What do you think they're going to say? All we treat is diabetes. And we specialize in this. Where are you going to go if you've had diabetes for 25 years? Of course, right? Yeah, it's clear, right? You're going to go to the Diabetes Institute. So 
This is, a, is an issue that we need to think about, about marketing, not just what we present, but how they perceive us. If we learn how the customer views us, then we can, we can, we can actually present our, the gospel and our ministry in a much better way so that they understand us, not just the way we understand ourselves. Okay, next point, tactfulness, okay? Untactfulness is a, is a very common mistake. So you can be too upfront with doing evangelism in your ministry, or you can be, uh, also you can never do it, right? So, but, but usually our, our tendency is if you're going to do a ministry, then you really want to do it, right? And so then you're, you're the first person to go out there and, the first person comes into your restaurant. This has happened, okay? In the States, I've seen this, you know. They come into your restaurant. The first thing they say, oh, welcome, you know, here's the steps of Christ, you know. <laughs> and everybody, and, you know, they, they walk in, it's like, what is this, you know? Are they trying to convert me? You know what I mean? Yeah, this happens, okay? So this is very, very, very important not to do, not to be very tactful about it. Uh, I had an experience. I was in South America in, in one of the places that we were visiting all the different centers of influence that the church started there. Actually, we did, my wife and I, when we got married, we did a, we did a seven-month honeymoon, okay? <laughs> and we visited like uh, at least 50 projects, okay, all over South America, Central and South America and, and, and here in Europe. And watched, you know, let's try to see what works and what doesn't work. And so there, we visited this guy, this, this, this project here, and uh, they're doing a center of influence. And I thought I was talking to him, and he was sharing everything that they do, and it, it just looked amazing, okay? I got this from their website. You know, they had a physician, they did general medicine there, they had, a, they had nurses doing stuff, they had psychologists uh, visiting people, do, giving seminars, and doing also counseling for free. I mean, all of this stuff was for free for the community. And I thought, wow, this is an amazing program. They had pathology, they had massages, they had, they had uh, school after, how do you say, tutoring, you know, helping in their schools. I mean, they had all kinds of things. They, had, they even had lawyers there giving help with people doing taxes and and, and all kinds of stuff, right? I mean, it was very, very amazing. And, and, and I'm like, so, so you must be, I mean, this place must be full with people. You know what he told me? And I think, so, I, I thought this would happen, but, but it's not a lot of people are showing up. Not a lot of people are coming. I don't know, it seems like they have like this, hesitation to come and I, and I and I don't understand why I was talking to the to the leader of the project and so I asked him so how do you present yourself you know if, if they're not coming and you have such a good project you know something's wrong with with your face right if the product is good something's wrong with your face and so and so I asked him and then he said well this is what we call ourselves okay it's called Adventist Center of Influence Okay, and and it's even worse in Spanish because in Spanish it doesn't say Adventist Center of Influence; it says Center of Adventist Influence. Okay, so it's, it's even worse. Okay, so I so I said so I told I asked him, you know, I was trying to be polite, you know, so I asked him, so so what if I told you, you know, do you want to go to a Mormon Center of Influence? And he looked at me, and he's like, that's true. <laughs> okay? So it's obvious if we think from uh, somebody else's perspective, right? We really have to get out of ourselves and realize how people look at us, okay? So don't, <laughs> don't brand your centers of influence like this, okay? It's not, it's not the most recommendable, all right? We need to do the Waldensian strategy. This is what I call it. The Waldensian strategy of, of being very, very tactful. Because if they were open and said, oh, we have a Waldensian center of influence right here, what would have happened? They're gone, right? Yeah, they're gone. 
So they had to be very, very tactful to be able to, to uh, reach these people and find exactly out when they're ready and then slip something under their, you know, into their hands and then leave, you know. <laughs> this was the, I mean, and I, we're not under persecution, so we don't have to be that careful, but, but this is the strategy, okay? We need to think about strategy. And there's some ministries that do a, I believe, do a very good job at this country life, Prague in, in Czech Republic, they have, they have, you know, they have, what is it now, nine, rest, nine health food stores and, and three restaurants and a bakery and a wholesale business, a, b- a big ministry. And they do business, they do mainly business in their business centers, but they have, in every place, they have things laying out for seminars and other things that are run by a nonprofit that is connected to the business. So it's not officially the business doing evangelism, but it's actually the nonprofit that does these seminars. And the nonprofit actually has a church on the second floor, right here, where you can't see. Yeah, that, that's, that's actually a church. They started a church there from the people coming through the health. health uh, the health food stores and the restaurants, right? And they also do lifestyle center programs. They don't have a place, but they do programs in hotels and different things. They rent it for two weeks. And, and, and there they have two weeks with the people. And so then they have much more time to start praying with them and, and really gaining the confidence and, and making friends. They already have a lot of confidence through the store, through the health food, through the restaurant. So they already like the, the thing and then they can lead them on. In, in Norway, we started, uh, together with Matheson, we started the Lifestyle Club. We branded it very, very um, neutral, right? It doesn't say Adventist Lifestyle Club, you know? Um, and, and this really, really helps. Now, we're not lying about anything. We say one of the partners for the Lifestyle Club is the Adventist Church, right here. Also, the municipality is also a, a partner, okay, of this club. So, and all of these other, other ministries, the health center right there, and a pizza place, and, and many things, huh? And Son Mat, yeah, is also part of it, Daddy, that's right. Yeah, so, Ellen White says, our institutions are designed to awaken a spirit of inquiry. So, it is when they start asking questions that we want to start giving answers, right? So it's, a, it's in a very tactful, tactful way. Okay, next, next point. Very important point. The MVP principle. Have you ever heard of MVP? Anybody? Yeah? Okay, a few people. All right, there's some business people in there. Oh, of course, Marcus, you know. MVP stands for Minimum Viable Product. We used to say, in, this is in self-supporting work, in missionary work in general, it's very common. We had the three S's of mission work. What do we call them? What are the three S's? Start simple, start small, and start soon. That's right, that's right. Those are, those, it really encapsulates this idea. But when we were thinking, also in the past, and in, in the past, it really worked well. When we were thinking small, we're saying, okay, the first thing we need to do, and this is what everybody thinks, okay? We want to start a lifestyle center. What is the first step you want to do? We need to find a property. <laughs> That's right. That's the first thing that people think of. A big asset, right? That costs a lot of money. And And the MVP principle, the minimum viable product, is actually the opposite of that. It's not to get a big property, a big asset on your leg and makes you not be able to move, but it's to really turn that around and say, how can we start something without having hardly any investment into this ministry and and see and, and make sure that the product market really fits, okay? That's the, that's the, that's the idea of minimum viable product. So, so what, what, we, what we tend to do is we tend to try, this is, this is what not to do, right? We tend to buy, when we're trying to get a car, we, we tend to start with a, a tire, like an asset, like a property, right? And then we go here, and then we try to build, 
and so forth. And the whole time during this time, I cannot use the car. Okay? But the idea is of a minimum viable product is to start with what? A skateboard, right? And then once I have enough, enough, it's worked enough, you have, you've generated a little bit of income, then you can buy a, bi a bicycle, then you can buy a motorcycle, and eventually you can buy a car, okay? You, can, you move up. This is, the, this is the MVP principle. There's some good examples of this. This lady in Russia, she wanted to start a, pro she wanted to start a project. She already had a little property, but she didn't have the money to build a house or to do anything like that. And she was just praying and, and, and seeing how God would open the doors to make this happen. And so she heard from the missionary school, the mission school that she had, went, had, she had gone to in, in the Ukraine, these three principles. Start simple, start small, and soon. That's right. And so she started praying. And instead of starting a lifestyle center, she started a lifestyle camp. Okay, so she got a little, a little tent like this and started doing diabetes reversal programs <laughs> as a camp, okay, a health camp, okay. And, and soon from just these, these projects, these, these, um, these programs, she was able to generate enough income to build now a few of these cabins where she can actually now start the lifestyle center. So this is, a, I, t I think this is a very smart way of doing it. Also, if you've heard of, of um, Steps for Life, Steps for Life in Sweden, they have a really smart way of doing it as well. They, they didn't start, they wanted to start um, a lifestyle program, but instead of buying a property, the first thing that they did with, uh, with their team is, okay, they had a few people, they had a few health professionals, a physician, a physical therapist, and a few people. And so they said, okay, let's just put on a website and we, we, we uh, tell people that we're going to do in our summer vacation, in my summer vacation, everybody's summer vacation, so nobody's paid for this, right? We rent a place. And if possible, add as a lifestyle center from somebody else, right? We rent the place and we promote it and see how many people come and charge a very small fee. And, and this is what they did. And nobody had to be paid. There was very little expenses and they were able to cover all of their expenses and they just did it once in the summer. And it was a success. And they were able to really engineer the the, the, the ministry program, the, the 10 days that they did um, to, to really make it just perfect with, the, with all the customer feedback that they got from the people that, that attended. So it was a very smart, uh, smart idea that they had. And so they've been doing this a number of times and now they're already more comfortable. They already have some experience. They're already more established. They can do multiple ones per year. And, and now they can start charging a little bit more because they're already used to it and so forth. So that is the minimum viable product, the MVP principle. And I think that really applies into, into um, every aspect of our ministries. Okay. The next one, distorting the blueprint. Okay, this, oh, this is a very common one, okay? We think of our blueprints when somebody says, "How should a, what should a lifestyle center look like? What should the ideal lifestyle center look like? How many beds should a lifestyle center have, a sanitarium? What do people say? What's ideal? 10, 12, 25, okay. So that, something like that, right? Uh, some, actually, many people in the States, there's a movement also, uh, the home sanitarium movement, right? And, and it's a good movement. I'm not against it. But it, they, what they say is the ideal thing is for you to do your lifestyle center in your home with, with you know, just a few, four rooms maybe. And you just start with that. Now, I agree with starting with that. And I agree with keeping it that way if, if that's what you call to do. But don't, let's not try to say that that is the blueprint, Okay. Because the blueprint, based on Ellen White's idea, the first sanitarium, even Battle Creek, in the beginning, okay, not in the end, but in the beginning, 
it started with like uh, it started with 50 beds okay and then it went up up to over 500 beds before they built the big sanitarium that Ellen White was against okay 500 beds and then she said when it burned down when Battle Creek burned down then Ellen White had visions of the smaller sanitariums that they were to start in California which were those what were they called? St. Helena Sanitarium. That, uh, I think that was later. Which else? Southern California? Loma Linda? What are the other two? Glendale Sanitarium? Paradise Valley Sanitarium? Okay, they, they started these. And she had visions of what they were, how they were like. And they started all of these projects. You know how, with how many beds they started? One of them was with 50 beds, the smallest one. The second one was 75 beds. The third one was 120 beds. Okay? And they started with that. Okay? That was not the end of it. Okay? And, so, and so I was a little bit surprised that even what we today think these are huge sanitariums, they were still considered home-like. Okay, in a home like they designed it in a home like way. So very interesting. I would be very careful to try to establish what is actually um, the size. So I think it's really based on the market, on the demand, and so forth as to how how big or how small uh, we should have our thing or our capabilities. Right? Drugs. Oh yeah. yeah. When Ellen White says drugs a hundred years ago. What was being what what was she fighting against? I really don't want to get into it too much with all these medical professionals around here, but what was she talking about? Yes, quinine. Yeah, what else? Quicksilver. Okay. Yes, arsenic. Yes. I mean, these things are poisonous. Okay, this is really poison, right? And and I'm not saying that all of the conventional medicine is really good either right that's also not true but we i think we need to really pay attention to when we read these quotes that we read them in the context and understand what she was trying to say and to apply these principles for us so there's a there's a balance in in all of these things oh yeah uh, this is another one everyone must do the exact same thing right uh we need to do sanitariums sanitariums need to just be like the same type of property the same type of that it's always a 10-day program or whatever, right? And, 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 and so forth. And so I think that there's room for different kinds of models on how we reach and what we reach. Not everybody has to do reach all the diseases, right? It, we can have... In the States, you have, they already had to start to specialize. If you think of healing depression, where are you going to go in the States? Neil Nedley, right? You're going to go to Weimar. If you're going to heal cancer, where are you going to go? You're going to go to Eden Valley, right? So they're already starting to specialize, not because they want to, but because the market demands it, right? So that's not bad. Also, I saw Matt was an interesting experience. Everybody said if you're, if they, it used to be run just as a pension, as a back pension. How do you say that? As a, as a little, a little hotel or a guest house, right? in the mountains and and but everybody said if you just do guest house then you're not doing what god wants you to do you have to do what it's got to be a lifestyle center okay it's got to be a lifestyle center now i just was there i happen to be related to them right so so i ha i happened to be there in in what was it june or somewhere sometime and I met some people that had been there as hotel guests, okay, for vacation. And they were invited as part of the being part of the hotel, you know. They were invited for these devotionals in the evening. Now, they didn't even know. They were atheists. They didn't even know what devotional means, right? But they're like, oh, it sounds interesting, you know. So they go to the devotional. And they got so excited about what they were hearing in these devotionals at this hotel, that they ended up getting Bible studies 
and they ended up getting baptized. Actually, they got married first, really, you know. And then they got baptized, and they even flew some people from Sonmat up to, to Berlin from where they're from to, to, to be part of their baptism, okay? I mean, it was very, very powerful. And I thought, wow, you can use a hotel to do ministry. It doesn't have to be a lifestyle center. Now, they also do a lifestyle center, which I think is great because they also do a lot of health work, and they, have, and they experience a lot of miracles, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later tonight. But, but, uh, but I think we need to be open. When Ellen White first started with, with um, doing centers of influence, she was in Australia in the 1890s. She was in Australia, and the business that she came up with to reach the people, they looked at the, uh, at the needs of the community, and they realized that they needed a laundry place. Okay, so this is not the real... This was not 100 years ago, believe me. But, but, but they, they started a laundry place and everybody came to wash their clothes there and then they gave them a little track saying, hey, God bless you, right? And, and they, did, they, they started their first center of influence, a sustainable center of influence as a laundry ministry, right? I thought that was so cool when I read this, right? I read this in De Sozo, actually. It talks about it in that book. From Dave Fiedler, great book. And people are getting more innovative, and I just want to share a few I- ideas of what people are doing to reach people. In Australia, an OCI, this is an OCI ministry, International Children's Care, they started a microfinance department where they give small, f- small credits to people, $100, $100 or something like that, and they help them analyze they train them in how to do business and then they and then they make them uh, help them to get get on their feet and do small business micro businesses and they have helped so far over 500 people and the cool thing is that that about 150 of the 500 have actually been baptized into the Seventh Day Adventist Church okay <laughs> Through microfinance. I mean, think about it. We haven't, I've never thought about using microfinance to reach people. Uh, it's a great third world uh, way of doing it. In Copenhagen, they have Happy Hand, which is a, which is a, a secondhand store. They have a very nice secondhand store, and they're reaching people through, through secondhand. It's a different kind of market, and this is very in in, 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 in Denmark. So, so many people come through this, and and get acquainted with, with uh, people that really desire their good, you know, and, and want to minister to them, and they're introduced to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Very cool. A uh, health food store, an uh, 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 online shop in, in Italy, Bio Salute. In, in, this is in Albania. They started, a, they started a, a music classes program, okay? They just teach classes, and this is how they reach the people in Albania, or in Colombia, they started a, an ecological pathway. Actually, they just bought this property, and it was just a wild place, a wild forest. And so they made this little pathway, and, and, uh, and they, have, they called it a touristic ecological pathway. <laughs> and then everybody, now everybody comes. They get, they get like a few hundred people coming through there uh, every month. And the students in their mission school give them like lectures along the way on the on the eight laws of health and stuff like this. I mean, they just they just invent ways of reaching people, right? It's so cool, and they, they, and everybody actually pays money to go through this ecological garden. Okay, so it's like everybody's paying them to evangelize them. Th- this is how I, I like that idea, you know? Yeah. Yeah, they have many, many things going on. Oh, this is Kure. You heard about this this morning, right? The lifestyle, uh, what is it called? The physical therapy clinic. I call it a lifestyle therapy. Physical therapy clinic in Copenhagen uh, that Peer and, and his friend and, uh, and another person started. Great place. Or in Norway, we connected this to the lifestyle club. Um, they started a... A two, it's called the Two Stone Express. It's a pizza place. 
You know, it's actually rated one of the top 10 restaurants in Norway, okay? Now, and it's and it's and they are they are there to sign up people. They get a discount if if they sign up to the lifestyle club for the pizza that they buy, okay? So, this is how it all it's all connected, right? So, this is really the way uh, we can use almost any kind of business to do evangelism. Obviously, the country life restaurants worldwide that have been used. I, I, I've, I've met people. I actually walked into this in Honduras. I, w- I took a taxi once. And the guy, the guy after, he, he was a very friendly guy. He talked with me and everything. And at the end, he gave me a little brochure. And it said, and it said uh, greetings from the 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 church of the latter day saints <laughs> okay what is it the mormon church right yeah and and i'm i'm like wow we need to do taxi work okay taxi ministry yeah taxi ministry actually in the philippines one of our ministries uh, another oci ministry there they have they bought 3 of these they call them jeepneys these are the taxis in in, in, in the Philippines, and people come up, actually, they're not called, this is not the, the actual one, this is, they call them, they call them, they bought three of them, and one of them is called the first angel's message, <laughs> second angel's message, and third angel's message, yeah. Yeah, and they just drive people around, and everybody that comes in, that goes into their jeepney, they just give them a, a, little, a little pamphlet of something, right? It's really, really cool. Okay, next point. Weird enough of that. The next point is there's no engineering being done on the business model. This to me is, I think, one of the, one of the things why we're not as successful as we can be in most of our, in most of our ministries is because w- that we don't pay attention to the, the, the business model that we're actually using. We just kind of do it implicitly. And when, I, when I've talked to, other, to leaders of ministries, I say, hey, let's work on the business model. You've got, right now, you've got 25% occupancy. You know, you've got 25% of your beds being occupied all the time. Why don't we just increase that by engineering the business model a little bit to like 50% or something like that? So you can make, your, right now you're getting by and it's okay, but you could be making a lot more and you could be reaching a lot more people this is this is part of engineering the business model and when i said that you know what the response was yeah but we're not doing this for money that's not the point you know we're doing this for for ministry right so we don't need to spend time if we spend time on business modeling it sounds like we're spending time on trying to make money you know what i mean it's it's, it's such a we have this separation ellen white says business and religion are not two separate things they are what one yeah yeah that's what we should do no but you know people don't know that there's more involved in a business than just a product you know it's not just a product it's there's, there's a whole environment. It used to be a little bit simpler, but today with so much competition and so forth, it's, it requires us to actually do a little bit of engineering. So I think that's really important. Okay, no cooperation. No cooperation with many different parties, with the church and so forth, this, this whole idea. I actually, I have a dream that s- at some point, you know, we would have... Uh, we would have a program called Church Planting 2.0, yeah? Church Planting 2.0, that every church, and they're doing this in some places, in Jakarta, in Muslim Indonesia, 90, what is it, 95% of, of Indonesia is Muslim. And so they decided to reach the Muslim community through health. And so what they did is the conference actually gave uh, this OCI, also it's an OCI ministry, they gave them uh, all the money they need for rent for one year to start a health food business, okay? So on the first floor, they have a health food business. And then from the health food business, they generate all the income and all the contacts. And then they invite them to the second floor 
which is what? It's the, he- it's the seminar room, okay? And so they invite them to the seminar room, and they make friends there, and they meet with them, and they have a lot of time with them. And then when it's time, they invite them where? To the third floor, which is the church. Yeah. And then, and then they have a, even a fourth floor, which is the prayer room, okay? And they, they have been so successful that the, that the General Conference actually made a video. I could show you. I think I'm going to show you. I think I have it here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they have duplicated this, this four-level model. Now, so far, they have 11 of these four-level centers of influence, Okay. And they have had the highest rate of baptism in these centers of influence, okay? In connecting the church with the thing. So my, my dream is that in Europe, we would start like a, like a health food, you know, we'd get Country Life involved from Prague or something, you know. We'd start a health food franchise or something, you know, with the first floor and the second floor automatically being a health lecture place and a church. Amen? Amen. That would be great. So let's just see the video. I don't know if I have a, a microphone. I didn't ask for the microphone. If we can use a microphone to just... I want to show you an excerpt. This is the GC that made a video for... Thank you. That made a video of this ministry. Jakarta, Indonesia. A city of nearly 12 million people. Jakarta is the political, economic, and cultural capital of Indonesia. Here, a small but influential Chinese community plays an important financial role in the city. Many of these Chinese looked to Christianity after an economic setback in the late 1990s. In 2003, a group of lay people felt a burden to reach out to the wealthy Chinese population living in Jakarta. Not knowing how to begin, they did what they knew how to do. They started praying. They tried a variety of methods with limited success. A Chinese church leader suggested the health message would touch the lives of the affluent members of society. Once again, the group turned to prayer. They found a four-story building with enough room so they could start a center of influence where they could invite people from the community. The Jakarta Conference helped with the rent for the first year to help get them started. On the first floor, they started a health food store to supplement the rent for the building. The second floor is a lecture hall or classroom for the public, and the third floor is a worship room that could eventually house a new group of believers. The top floor is the most important room in the building, the prayer room. Here, the prayers for the ministry filter down to each of the levels below. The group then felt led to start a radio program about health, which airs on a local radio station. The radio program was well received. They invited listeners to a health seminar in their new building. When the first guest came, the members were so excited, God was blessing their ministry. Leong Pit Lin conducts health seminars twice a week at the center. A cancer survivor, she has had three types of cancer. Many people who attend the health seminars were sent there by their doctors who gave up on them and suggested they go to the center for help. Center volunteers partner with each guest, calling them every day to give support and to pray with them. The health message is a very effective tool for evangelism. I meet various types of people from the middle and upper classes, including intellectuals, physicians, pastors, and writers. Many have asked me, what is your religion? And I share with them and invite them to join us for the Sabbath afternoon Bible study. Currently, the Chinese Ministry Center, as it is called, is self-supporting and reaches more than just the affluent Chinese in the city. It reaches all socioeconomic members of the society. When I feel down because of the huge challenges I face, just seeing the many people who are thirsty for the truth encourages me to continue to witness for Him. People are attracted to the center of influence because of the message that's presented there. And that is how to live healthy, but not only physically, but mentally and spiritually. And so they are hungry, hungry and thirsty for that information. 
The ministry has grown to include four centers with 60 to 100 visitors on a regular basis. Each center is supported by two to three area churches and is lay driven. Three of the centers have regular organized congregations that meet there, and one of these churches had the highest number of baptism in the conference for the year. Once a person is baptized, they are given a job to assist the ministry and integrate them into the faith. The Sabbath church services are packed with visitors, and the services include time devoted to united prayer. By humble means and simple and varied methods, God is blessing them as they mingle with people, sympathize with their problems, minister to their needs, win their confidence, and point people to the Savior. They have plans to build a health education center where they can train more health and Bible workers to expand the ministry. They have found some land, raised some funds, and still need to raise more in order to make this dream a reality. Your prayers and offerings will help make this possible. Amen, huh? Amazing. So I think one of the major issues that we have in being more successful in mission work, in especially in secular uh, societies like Europe, is that we don't have an effective system on how to connect people from centers of influence to the church, okay? So that we actually connect because the centers of influence are the ones who generate all of the contacts, who do the sewing, you know? Who, who, who make friends and so forth and then bring them to the church to get baptized and so forth. But what, what our system, our, the way we've, we've been doing church for the last, I don't know, how many years, um, is that we forgot about all of these centers of influence and that we should use all of these private businesses and so forth to, to meet people and to connect with people and to make contacts and to sow so that when we go to the church that we can actually reap something, right? We go to church and we're saying, why do we not have many baptisms? Well, we don't have any. We, we, why are we not reaping tomatoes? Well, you got to plant tomatoes to reap tomatoes, right? It makes sense. And, but we only focus on the church in the center and we forget that the church needs to be surrounded by an ecosystem of these the kind of ministries. LOI calls it a beehive of all these little bees that reach people and bring people connecting each other to be able to reach people and bring people into the church. I've experienced this in, in the States at Wildwood, for instance, with, they, 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 with their restaurant uh, that, they, that they had in Chattanooga. Um, people would go in there and they would, they, would, they would eat this food and they were like, oh, wow, where can I get this stuff? And we were like, well, there's a, there's a health food store right outside of Chattanooga, right? You can buy some, some of these things, and they'll even teach you how to use it, okay? And then they go over to the health food store, and at the health food store, they tell them, look, I have diabetes, or I have this, or obesity, or whatever. And then they um, say, oh, you know what? We have a lifestyle center right up the hill that, that in 90% of the cases can help you with your diabetes, Okay? In 90% of the cases. And they're like, what? Really? Oh, wow, nice. And so they go up there, and all of these people are so nice, and so they feel like, wow, this is really cool. You know, this is like a whole, it's like a movement, you know? And so then they go there, and they're there for two weeks, and at the end of the two weeks in the lifestyle program, many of them want to be, want to, want to say, I don't know what your religion is, but I want to be that, you know? Like, they don't even <laughs> understand everything. But they're so excited about it because they see that it works and that it really helps people. And so, and so often, and even, and especially at these lifestyle centers, all of their guests, most of the guests, they end up going to church on Sabbath, right, during the program. They end up going to church. So there's all these guests all the time, and, and that's when they hear all of these things. So the idea is not that everybody, that all of these things should be owned by one person or by one ministry. It should be many ministries and everybody 
should cooperate with each other to provide this kind of a beehive, okay? But unfortunately, we're trying to do evangelism like this, okay? So no, no wonder we're not getting as much reaping if we don't have all the sowing entities as part of our evangelism concept. So I think that's uh, very important. Okay, there's really good quotes on this, on this. Enfeebled and defective as it may appear, the church is the one object upon which God bestows in a special sense his supreme regard. The medical missionary work should be a part of the work of every church in our land. Ah, every church. Huh? Disconnected from the church, it would soon become a strange medley of disorganized atoms. Everywhere, right? Yeah, it would be a mess. It would consume and not produce. Ah, very interesting. Instead of acting as God's helping hand to forward the truth, it would sap the life and force from the church and weaken the message. So we need to really make sure that we do these things, but we really do it in connection with our local churches. So this is really important. How to connect these things? Well, ASI and OCI has really worked very hard for many decades now to try to make sure that all of these ministries uh, are connected and are, are supportive of the Adventist Church. You know, they have policies in place for, for its membership and so forth, like they're not allowed to take tithe because, you know, it, 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 the church needs tithe. If the church doesn't have tithe, what happens to the church? To the remnant church. Yeah, it's going to die, okay? It's very simple, right? So we, we don't want to do that. So, so, um, so this is very important, okay? Regular communication with the, with the, with the local conference and so forth, if, you know, all these, the ministries, and not creating any special doctrines, weird things. This has happened, unfortunately. Um, and not having a bad attitude and not criticizing the, the church because we are part of the church. I'm part of the church. I'm not going to criticize myself, right? Yeah. So this is very important. ASI used to be having a self-supporting institutions, by the way. ASI now and OCI, they really push this, okay? They've, they're an, an umbrella organizations that really help um, bring all of these ministries to work together amongst each other, to synergize amongst each other, and also to, to work together, closely together with the church. And I think that's really important. And I think ANAT does a very good job at also connecting these, these things um, as, as, as they've been working. Okay, fanaticism in the next one. Oh man, there's many, I could tell you so many stories, but we're, we're, we're getting out of time. So I know a person in Honduras, not from our ministry, but a guy that, that he read a quote from Ellen White where it said that that lifestyle center was located exactly 56 kilometers outside of the church, outside of the city. Right? So guess what he did? He got his, what do you call it? The circle, the compass. And he did a whole circle of 56 kilometers around the, the city that he lived in. And he said, somewhere on that edge, I'm going to find a property, the divine ordained property, to start a lifestyle center. How do you like that? And he actually went. He went through all of the places, and then eventually he found exactly on the right coordinates. He found this property in the middle of the mountain, in the middle of nowhere, Okay. It took him two hours to get to the city. And unfortunately, um, nobody really went there because it was way too far away, okay? It's way too far out, right? And always says we should be close to the city but not close enough that we would get affected uh, by the city and by the pollution or whatever. And so, and so uh, I think we need to realize that fanaticism is when we stop thinking and understanding the principles behind why she said what she said and why we're doing what we're doing. And she, he, the poor man, you know, he didn't have access to all of Ellen White's writings because not all of it was translated. 
But there's many other, tra- other quotes where she talks about 10 miles or she talks about 15, 25. I mean, all kinds of things, right? And it's not just 56 kilometers, right? So that's really important. Or no meals for supper in, in restaurants, you know, and then they don't have enough income to be able to sustain it. Things like this happen all the time. Oh, yeah, food is the, is the most important thing, right? It's the only thing that's going to help you. Well, well, you're all aware, more aware even than I am that it's, it's, food is a part of it, but it's, there's a much bigger picture of how health really works, right? It's just one component, like mental health and all this other stuff. And these quotes, they really have helped me, and I've used these a lot for many, in many ministry settings. It's worth writing down. She, Ellen White says, we should be guided by two things, she says. We should be guided by true theology and what? Common sense. Yeah, common sense is not very common today. This is, this is what I'm realizing, okay? Yeah, this is a very, is, I think it's very, very important, okay? Common sense is, is part of our strategy to find truth, and true theology, okay? We can't go off on theology either. You know, too much common sense, you know, throws away the one. Too much theology throws away the other, okay? So in a, special, in a specific sense. Oh, and this is also a very good one that, that I use often in, in ministry settings. Ellen White says, <clears throat> regarding the testimonies, her writings, nothing is ignored, okay? Nothing, we cannot say, oh, this is not inspired or something like that. Nothing is ignored, nothing is cast aside, but we need to regard one thing. Time and place must be considered, right? Time and place must be considered. When she says, don't drive bicycles, it's obvious to us, right? Yeah, there's actually laws in the Bible where it says you need to go to the bathroom in a certain way. You know what the way is you should go to the bathroom? It says it in numbers. You need to pick up a, 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 a shovel, go out of the camp, dig a hole, and do the thing, close it up, and then come back, right? Now, do we still apply this principle, this, this, this rule to us? Yes, thank you. We do apply that, right? What's the principle behind it? Why did, why did Moses, why did God tell Moses to say that? Yeah, hygiene, right? These are the principles. That makes a lot of sense if you're traveling through the desert, right? But we're not. We, we, because we regard that principle, we have now built these nice bathrooms, right? Yeah, that's what we call them. So th- this is really, I think it's very important. So we understand the principle and then apply it to our time in which we are. Second to the last, uh, no planning. I've seen this so many times that people say, and this is true, right? Ellen White says that we are, we are not able to plan for ourselves. We have not that capacity. Is that true? Yes, it's true. We do not have that capacity, okay? But she at the same time says we need to plan but under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And what's the connection? I love this. Oh, oh, I, had, oh, I forgot this. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Okay, it's clear. Ellen White says, this is the prayer we should pray every day. And this is where the balance comes together. She says, we need to pray. Take me, O Lord, as holy thine. I lay all my, what? Plans at your feet. Use me today in thy service. So what are you going to play at Jesus' feet if you don't have a plan? What are you going to lay at Jesus' feet? Ah, You have nothing to lay at Jesus' feet, right? Yeah, so the idea is actually that we lay our plan, we make a plan, we lay that plan at Jesus' feet and let him direct us. I've, seen, I've heard so many people say, well, Jesus always changes my plans on me, you know. So I've learned not to plan, right? 
but that's not the ideal either, right? So we need to learn to plan, but surrender the plan every day, step by step, moving forward. If we stop planning, what happens to us? Well, then we start drifting, and we drift. If we don't plan, I have this all the time at all of our mission schools. After the year's over, and they don't have a plan, and they're all very spiritual. It's like, well, you know, just praying that the Lord will, you know, the Lord will direct, you know, I, I don't have a plan, right? And then they go back, and then they go right back home into, into the old trends. Yeah. So planning is the most effective tool to get out of those old plans to move forward, right? Yeah, so this is very important. Ellen White says it all over. I just have a few, a few statements here. Success in any line demands a definite aim. Yeah, an aim means you have to have a goal. And she says here, a life goal, right? For your whole life, you should have a goal. We need to plan. There must be far more personal responsibility, far more thinking and planning, far more mental power brought into the labor f- put forth for the master. Yeah, very important. She says, all the enterprises in temporal earthly things prosper in proportion to the wisdom, tact, and concentration of powers exercised in acquiring the desired object. So, is the more energy I put into it, the more successful that thing will become. Yeah. And the last one, that we are not successful in some instances, or in many instances, is that we don't listen to the spirit of prophecy. We don't listen to to the prophets, right? Kellogg was the most successful, Ellen White says, he was the most successful physician that the world knew during that time. Worldwide, he was the best physician and he was recognized by the world as the best physician in the world at Battle Creek Sanitarium. And it was because he listened to everything that Ellen White said and he understood the principles, and whatever kind of idea, whether it was crackery, whether it was real, a good rational uh, therapy, he would analyze it based on that, compare it, and if it, met, if it matched, then what would he do? He would implement it into the Battle Creek Sanitarium. And this is why the Battle Creek Sanitarium became the most successful and and most prestigious health center for in the time in which it existed. Yeah. I mean, very, very powerful, right? And it was because of this, because he listened to the prophecy. The Bible says, where there is no vision, we usually apply this to like visionary or something, but the, pr- the word means prophecy, where there is no, the, the Hebrew word means where there is no prophetic vision, the people perish. But he that keeps the law, he is happy. Yeah. So these are the, what I consider the top 10 medical ministry mistakes that we commonly make. And I hope that this has been a benefit to, to all of you with my you know, limited experience, but But I think if we do some of these things, if we do all of these things, I think the success of our ministries can can really be uh, improved in a great way. And all of this will not do anything if we do not submit to the Holy Spirit working in our lives. Amen? So with that, I want to end. And um, shall we pray? Let's pray. Let's stand for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we are so grateful that you have led us in the past and you have shown us the things that you want to do with us and you want to do with the church and you've given us these visions of all of these centers of influence and all of these physical therapy clinics and and health centers and practices and, and all of these centers that we should be using, that we can be using. You've given so much potential into the church that we can be using to advance your work. And Lord, this is why we're here. This is why Enad exists. And, 
And so we pray, Lord, that you can fill us, fill us with your spirit, that we can learn from history and move forward and move forward under the guidance of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.